Okay, here is the next part of the PowerPoint presentation on the origins of sociology. We just finished up talking about mechanical and organic solidarity. We move on to the third person, uh, Max Weber. It's pronounced V, uh, even though it's spelled with a W. Uh, Max Weber was kind of a lucky guy. He was a German historian, economist, and sociologist, so he was doing different things as well. He was really lucky in that he was born wealthy. Lucky guy. Didn't have to work much. Uh, so he was able to write a whole bunch of crap. Uh, actually, not crap, but pretty good stuff. He was a prolific writer. He was also sickly and was very shy and introverted. Now, some of the important contributions from Weber we will talk about are, are subjective meanings or subjectivity, bureaucracy, uh, the idea of legal rational authority, uh, traditional versus rational thinking, as well as the idea of a value-free sociology. And these terms are discussed to some extent in your book. I'm going to expound a little bit more here. If something is subjective, and this is an important uh, concept to talk about in sociology, if, if something is subjective, that means that it is open to interpretation. I could pass around a pizza with pepperoni and mushrooms, banana peppers, and some of you would like that. Some of you would not like that at all. It's the same thing, you're tasting the same food, but your interpretation is different. I could play a musical selection for you right now. Some of you would like the song, some of you would not like the song, some of you would be like, I could care less. So your interpretation, the subjective meaning you attach, is going to vary. How different cultures and thus different individuals assign different meanings to different components of culture is what we're talking about when we talk about subjective meaning. Um, Examples that I can think of readily are traffic lights. Now, we have sort of arbitrarily decided in this country, within our culture, that red, red lights symbolize what? When you're driving, stop, right? And green symbolizes go. And yellow symbolizes hurry up and get through real quick. <laughs> Just kidding, sort of. Uh, yellow symbolizes yield. So we, we have very specific definitions, if you will, or understandings of what different colors mean on the road when we're driving. It's not this way everywhere in the world. Um, if you travel to some parts of Europe, for example, their stoplight, you might have a blue light at the top of this light fixture that would symbolize stop. If I see blue lights, I'm thinking, rut row, it's the police again. <laughs> Just kidding, kind of. Um, but in that part of Europe, you might have a blue light at the top that symbolizes stop, and then a, you, know, you might have a red light at the bottom that would symbolize go. So we would be very confused if we were driving in this situation for the first time but they've arbitrarily, in their part of the world, assigned that meaning to those colors. Uh, driving lanes and automobiles in Europe, the steering wheels are on the right-hand side of the car and they're driving on the left-hand side of the road, it's completely opposite of what we do here in the United States. So we would be very, it would be very different for us to try to adjust to that. Uh, cell phones, uh, we are very attached to our cell phones in this culture, in this country. Um, very much so. If you went into an Amish community and handed someone a cell phone, they would probably not attach the same meaning to it. They wouldn't really care anything about it. Um, Weber talks about bureaucracy as well as uh, legal rational authority. Now, you've all dealt with bureaucracies whether you realize it or not. A bureaucracy is a rationally based organization with a power structure, a hierarchy that ranks from, in power from the top to the bottom. Some of you probably work, maybe, I don't know, fast food jobs or, or maybe at the mall, I don't know, anywhere. Probably you're an entry level person, nothing wrong with that. You're at the bottom of the, of, the, of the food chain, if you will. If you work your way up gradually, your boss has a boss. That boss will have a boss. That boss will have a boss. And so you get all the way to the very top where you have the president or the CEO. Um, that's bureaucracy, and a lot of times the positions in companies become more important than the human beings or the people that actually fill those positions. And that's where Weber says that bureaucracy can be a problem. It can be dehumanizing. I'll give you a better example of that. I would always ask the question in class, if you have a job, how many of you have ever been at a job and your boss or supervisor has, says, has said the following to you or ask you the following question? You can easily be replaced. If you don't want to be here, we can easily find someone else to fill your position. And then they go about their way, not even caring about you. Um, that's an example of bureaucracy. The position becomes more important than you, the human being. Now, legal rational authority, this is another dehumanizing 
part of society according to Weber. Weber says that within our society, as in most industrialized and more complex societies, we legally place people with the best qualifications into certain positions. We almost have a legal obligation. In some cases we do have a legal obligation to do so. Uh, teachers, I will indict my own here, uh, for example. Uh, we have a tendency to think just because a teacher has been around for 30, 40 years, that he or she is the best qualified or the most qualified. So they get to pick it's, you know, the classes they teach, where they go. They can even bump other teachers out of positions in the public school system. Um, is that always a good thing? Um, you can probably think of some teachers who've been around for a while who probably are not very good anymore. Um, so Weber says this is not always a good policy. Uh, but these are two policies that modern societies tend to adhere to. Then you have traditional versus rational thinking. Uh, traditional thinking involves a reference for the past or history, adhering to custom and tradition, and it's really thinking that's guided by the past. You see this a lot in primitive societies like hunting and gathering, uh, pastoral societies, horticultural societies. Um, it's like we've always done it this way, and we're always going to do it this way because this is how we've always, this is how we've always done it. Um, now, rational thinking is more characteristic of, of modern societies, like the one that we live in today. Goal and future directed thinking that deals with the most efficient way to obtain a goal. Uh, thinking is deliberate, it's calculated, and it's marked by less sentimentality. Uh, nothing wrong with being efficient, but some sociologists argue that our never-ending quest for efficiency can create a lot of problems for us. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Fifty years ago, people would, would, would wash their food, they would prepare, they would cook it sit down as a family, eat it, clean it up. You might have two or three hours in this process, but as a family, people were sitting down, they were talking, uh, they were spending time. Was it very efficient? Is it efficient to spend two or three hours on dinner today? Would you guys do that with your busy schedules and your sports, your social lives and you know homework and jobs? Probably not. I know I don't. Um, it's, it would be difficult to do that. So some sociologists have argued that with our rational thinking, which is, you know, typical of our society that we live in, that, you know, it actually hurts us. Um, instead of preparing a meal, sitting down, eating it, uh, in my family often we're going in different directions. We may hit a drive through you know, while we're on our phones talking, hit the drive through eat it on the way to the next practice or event or job or wherever we're heading next. Everything's got to be quicker. It's got to be now. It's got to be more efficient. Same with the news. People used to read a newspaper. They would wait to get a newspaper in the morning and read it. Now we just go on our phones or go online and we've got a thousand pieces of news. It's more efficient that way. But we also lose communication and interaction with other people in our quest for efficiency. Weber also stresses that sociology should be value-free. Um, this is a view that sociologists' personal values or beliefs should not influence social research. Uh, hypothetically, if I'm very pro-life, if I'm doing research on abortion, my attitude, if I'm very strongly pro-life, may bias my research. I may come up with results intentionally or, uh, or, not, or not intentionally that, supports, that, that would support my view. So we have to be careful not to be that way when we're doing research. We want to present accurate information. Uh, values are the standards by which we define what is desirable or undesirable, good or bad, beautiful or ugly. Objectivity, the value of neutrality in research. To, to, to be objective means that we're being fair-minded. Uh, we're suspending bias, if you will, which is hard to do. Now, Karl Marx is a guy you've probably heard a lot about. He's very popular in history classes. If you had history or economics, you've probably heard of him. He wrote a big old book called Das Kapital. Maybe you've heard of that. He was a radical German philosopher. Um, Marx, again, as brilliant as he was, had some kind of had a dark side as well. Um, neglected his family. He was so obsessed with his studies and his research that he would often sleep in the libraries of Germany, and would neglect his children to the point where I, I believe he actually lost one or two of his children. They died because of neglect. Not a good thing, at all. Uh, was not a good speaker either. Was very poor his entire life. But he was one whale of an organizer. He could really get people together and was good at getting people to unite. Um, Marx is important ideas. We could do a whole course just on Marx. His influence on sociology goes a very long way. And we still talk about his ideas today. Uh, he talks about the, the bourgeois versus the proletariat. 
In other words, the ruling class versus the working class. Ideologies, the idea of false consciousness, exploitation, alienation, class consciousness, and the idea of utopia. Now, Marx said basically you have a two-class system. You have the ruling class and the working class. And I'm going to refer to the ruling class as the bourgeois. Um, it's also pronounced the, the bourgeoisie, but I'm going to pronounce it the bourgeois because it's easier for me to say that. You have the very few in number at the top who are taking advantage of and exploiting the fewer in number at the bottom, the wor or the larger in number at the bottom, the working class. Many more people in the working class than there are in the ruling class. So Marx started to have some questions. Uh, Marx was living in Europe during the time of the Industrial Revolution. People were moving away from living on farms, and we were moving away from an agricultural economy where people were farming, to now living in cities where factories are popping up everywhere, and people are working in horrifically awful conditions, working long hours, dangerous conditions, uh, industry starts to boom, and you have a few at the very top, the bourgeois, who are making all kinds of money, but taking advantage of the masses at the very bottom. So Marx is thinking, well, the ones at the bottom way outnumber the ones at the top. Why don't they just rise up and revolt? Why don't they do something about that? Well, Marx had some ideas about why that happened. Um, Marx talked about ideologies. These are combinations of values and norms that all members of society are expected to believe in and act upon without question. Uh, Christianity is an example of an ideology. Uh, freedom is an example of an ideology. Now these aren't bad things in and of themselves. Nothing wrong with being a Christian, obviously. Nothing wrong with being uh, independent or valuing freedom, obviously. But Marx said the ruling class used these ideologies to take advantage of, of people at the bottom. For example, people at the working in the working class were told, accept your lot in life, work hard, don't complain, don't revolt, your reward will come in heaven. So a lot of times people would and stay with that. And Marx called this a sense of false consciousness or false awareness. People at the bottom of the, of the, of the food chain believed that this was their place. Nothing they could do about it. I'm a working class person. There's nothing I can do about it. My reward will come later. Well, Marx was coming along saying, not so fast. You can change this. Marx argued that the people in the lower class and the working class, rather, were exploited and alienated. Now, we've all been exploited. To be exploited simply means you've been taken advantage of. If you have jobs, I would ask you how many of you have ever been asked to perform extra duties for no more pay, by the way, or been asked to work extra hours or to pick up the slack for someone who called off. So now you got to kind of do their job, too, and you don't get really compensated any extra for that. You're being taken advantage of, according to Marx. Uh, and then alienation is separation. People were separated in the working class, not only from the products they produced, because they couldn't afford them, uh, but also from each other. They were working long, terrible hours. They didn't have time to sit around and complain with each other about their lot in life. It was all they could do just to survive. And the, and the ruling class kept the working class members oppressed and suppressed. Marx argued that, that the people in the working class could eventually develop class consciousness. This is, in other words, they could realize, hey, you know, we don't have to accept being taken advantage of, exploited, alienated. We can rise up and revolt, and we can kind of change this. And the idea Marx had was that this would happen at some point, and things would be a little more, resources would be a little more evenly distributed, instead of a few at the top getting almost everything, and those at the bottom getting almost nothing. And a lot of people accuse Marx of being a utopian prophet. Uh, his idea of a perfect society. A, uto a utopia literally translates to perfect society. Now, the problem with utopia, or the idea of a utopia, is that not everybody's idea of what a, what a perfect society is is, is going to match up. Uh, my idea of a utopia may be very different from yours. Uh, I always ask the question in class, what is your idea of a perfect society? What would it contain? Nobody can agree on it. So is there really such a thing as, as a utopia? Probably not. Some societies, some countries have tried to approach this. They've used Marx's ideas to try to establish you know, socialistic or communistic countries. Now, Marx was not a communist, by the way. That's a common misconception. And we'll talk about that later. And we'll go ahead and call that the end of this part. Thanks.